The following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. It's a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome to the Advisor's Option, the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews with leading advisors, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. And now, please welcome your hosts, Mark Longo, Mike Cavanaugh, and Eric Cott. Welcome back to the Advisor's Option, the program designed for... Busy financial advisors and asset managers who are interested in adding options to their portfolios. My name is Mark Longo from the OptionsInsider.com as well as the old Options Insider Radio Network. And I am joined today by... First off, starting off to my right, the uh, my usual co-host, or my stalwart companion here on the Advisors Option, good old Mike Cavanaugh from Know Your Options, Inc. Mike, welcome back to the program. It's always great to be back. And also joining us on the program for the first time today is Randy Swan. He is the president of Swan Wealth Advisors. Randy, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Well, we're glad you can have you. And we should mention recording once again from the 2012 Options Industry Conference here in New Orleans, also the site of the Wealth Advisors Summit, which is a a very interesting first-of-its-kind conference designed for financial advisors and asset managers who are interested in learning more about options and how to implement them into their practices. And so, Randy, I know you're down here to participate in that conference, and you'll also be on my panel tomorrow here at the Options Industry Conference. We'll be talking about, surprise, surprise, once again, financial advisors and how they may or may not be using options. Randy, we're glad we can have you on the program. So why don't you go ahead and give our listeners a little bit of an overview of what you guys do over there at Swan Wealth Advisors, and particularly how you guys implement options into your practice. Yes, we our firm offers a hedged equity income strategy called the defined risk strategy. We've implemented that strategy since 1997, so we have almost 15 years of experience in the strategy. And to briefly go through what that strategy entails, it's a long ETF, typically SPY or the select spiders. We also hedge it with long-term put options and do monthly income trades, whether it's strangles, calendars, butterflies, to generate income. So that you know that's interesting. And why don't you also maybe illuminate our listeners a little bit about about how you got lured to to the dark side of options, as it were. What is your what is your background when it comes to options? Yes, I'm actually a CPA. I worked as a senior manager at KPMG in Houston in the financial services group. Uh, I left in 1996, 1997 to start this. I worked with mostly insurance companies, risk managers, and uh, risk departments of large companies. This was a very uh, good segue and to get into the options because I really appreciate and like the way these companies, whether they were Fortune 500 companies or small individual companies, managed risk. And when I, when I really started as an avid investor since I was much younger, started learning about options, I thought this is a really unique strategy that allows, I think at the, at the time, was, was not really being utilized very much for uh, retail investors and, and clients and stuff like that. Surprisingly, it still isn't being used very much by, by retail advisors and clients, but we'll get to that in a minute. And I like to ask whenever we have a guest on the show kind of how they came to options, because it is interesting to see the different paths people take. Mike and I obviously come from the degenerate floor trader side of the fence. So we were kind of brought into options in, in the maelstrom, as it were. But 
for someone like you who kind of came to it from outside, it's interesting to see how you came to that realization that there was an opportunity there for options and or the dreaded D word derivatives to add additional return and reduce some of the volatility of your traditional equity trading strategies. Yes. You know, our, our approach was always that asset allocation is a viable strategy, but it's not enough to control risk. As everyone saw in 2008, when risk really became the main focus of the market, that um, the asset allocation, correlation coefficients, all asset classes seemed to go to one at that time. And that was just a further uh, prove to us that, that, that options are needed in this kind of market environment. Obviously, options offer you the uh, to, to develop you know, various uh, profit risk programs and uh, really eliminate the risk you do not want and try to keep some of the risk that you do want to generate the type of income or or capital appreciation that you want over time. I felt like that that the the general view in the market just was not going to was not going to work in what kind of a market environment we have right now. I mean, looking at what we have right now, a lot of us who were taught the cap M model at an early age and we're taught that standard diversification is your own 12 different equity underlyings. Perhaps you get a little crazy, you go a little bit emerging market, you go a little bit gold, a little bit commodity, and you're essentially diversified and you're hedged against all foreseeable risks. And as you've said, we've seen in the recent market environments that that is not exactly the case when so many different asset classes are moving almost in lockstep, 80% correlation almost across the board. Are, Are you of the opinion, Randy, then that in this day and age, it is nigh impossible to really achieve true diversification without implementing some sort of option or derivative into the portfolio. I, I would totally agree with that. I think that market risk can only be hedged by using derivatives and options. Well said, sir. I couldn't, I couldn't have Very said succinct. It. I, I, <laughs> I like I, that. It, it, it triggered a question with me because, um, you know, this is Randy's first show. It's an interview. We're kind of casting him to, into the coals here. But our our listener and audience base are, are advisors. So, when when I've done other shows or panels in the industry, the question I always get from advisors is, hey, Randy, this is, well, I'm Mike, but hey, <laughs> I'll ask the questions the advisors are thinking here. Randy, I really like your story, your background. You're a director at KPMG. You worked with insurance companies. You saw what these Fortune 500 companies were doing, and now you're doing it. You're an SEC registered RIA with over $100 million under management, and you've got a strategy that you manage. Randy, I'm not as smart as you. Randy, I'm not going to take the next 15 years of my life to go get a director position at KPMG to make relationships, to learn what these insurance companies are doing. How can I work with you, Randy? I'm also an RIA. I'm also a... I really care about my clients. I think you may know more than me about the markets and how to hedge risk using derivatives that I just really don't want to take the time to 15 years. You've got the experience. Is there anything I can do to work with you as a sub advisor? Is there anything I can do? That's the question I've gotten at shows wondering if you get those questions and do you have a solution or proposed solution to work with other advisors to help them with their clients? Yes, that's that's a great question. I like to get that often. That's that's our business model is to attract other advisors that are willing to come to the dark side and use options. Of course, now the appetite for options is a lot greater than it was, you know, even three or four years ago, especially before 2008. So, yes, we actually develop a program. We have a unique program, we think, that really eliminates most of the downside risk to um, in a long equity strategy portfolio. So, yes, we actively are looking for other advisors. And I think that uh, some of the other issues that we'll talk about at some point is the changing nature of the brokerage business that allows um, advisors on the institutional side or for, for advisors to actually use options in their portfolio. I think that the brokerage platforms have come a long way over the last three or four years. In fact, I think a lot of the stuff that we've offered on the separately managed account basis has just become possible in the last five years. So it's good to see other brokerage firms uh, take a step forward and, and start act- actively promoting strategies like ours and, and see the need for it, and, and c- they can obviously uh, distinguish themselves out in the market. So that brings up an interesting question, and one that I receive all the time, I'm sure, Mike, you do as well, is that essential stumbling block question. On paper, so many financial advisors, asset managers, fund managers, the bulk of them are long-only equity guys. On paper, 
they dovetail perfectly with options. They should be buying puts and writing calls and all the things we discuss on this show on a regular basis. Yet, they're not. And the large majority of them are simply not doing that. So, Randy, I'm, I'm curious. You know, We've extolled about this at length on this show. I'd like to get your take on this. What do you think are the, the major obstacles, the major stumbling blocks that are keeping advisors from really – following in your footsteps and implementing options into their practices? I would say the first thing is the advisor has to think outside the box and and actually see a need for something different than the way they've done in the past. Unfortunately, in this industry, a lot of people like to they feel comfort in doing the same thing as everyone else. I think the advisor has to come to that recognition, come to that decision before they can make the next step. Once they've made that that step, then they deal with the logistical issues of going through the paperwork of setting up accounts, options ag- agreements, margin agreements, having to explain to their clients that they may have spent a lot of time you know, doing their due diligence and learning about options, and, and the advisor gets to a certain level to be able to do that. Then, of course, they have to go back to their clients and, 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 and try to convince their clients that this is the way to go. I think those are the biggest obstacles right now. Like I said earlier, I think that the brokerage firms are moving in the right direction. I wish it would have happened earlier, but uh, I think 2008 has really woken everyone up. So I think the appetite is is definitely there at this point. Maybe before we even get into the brokerage firms, I certainly want to get into that because that is a significant piece of the puzzle. But maybe even we take take a step back even before that. And how does that proverbial advisor who's interested in options, what do you think gets him to take that first step you were just talking about of, you know, thinking outside the box. Is, are the existing exams that they're taking, the CFA, CFP, are those sufficient to kind of get them down the rabbit hole of options? Or is it something really they kind of have to come to on their own and be discovering in other venues and then bringing that internally? I'm, what I'm asking, I guess, is are the current paths in place to really bring them into options, are they sufficient? Or do we need additional, I guess you can call them stimuli, to bring them into, into the fold? I think that there probably needs to be a, a, some additional education involved, but I think that the biggest and the biggest reason for advisors to make the change is 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 the past, is their volatility, it's the risk that that advisors now see. You know, quite frankly, advisors, brokers got away with for you know twenty twenty five years with you know the market pretty much going up consistently with very few drawdowns, and it's just been it's been in the last five years or maybe even ten years that people starting to see. So the risk. So I think it's a two-pronged approach. One, they've got to get some education, get comfortable with the the concept of using options to hedge our portfolio. We ask, we tell all our clients and our advisors, we come back to the basic concept. Everyone insures their life, their health, their autos, their their houses, their boats. Um, why do you not insure your portfolio? That's the really biggest concept. If you ask that question, people can get to get to the. Um, get to a point where they can make that decision because the fact is we all insure every aspect of our life when we have financial loss except for our, our, our portfolios. And of course, most advisors have been taught over the years that the way you solve the risk in portfolios would be diversified. Of course, we know diversification isn't all that you need to have. And that's where you get to that, that conclusion. I'll, I'll dovetail a little. It's not a question as much as d- to support Randy's answer um, and maybe for our listeners, provide them with an extra tidbit there. You know, Randy made the good point of, you know, advisors thinking outside of the box to engage with the concept of options. And um, Eric Cott from the uh, OIC has mentioned this in the past. And John Haig from uh, McLadry was talking earlier. And I talked to a a whole bunch of accountants all the times. Um, They're they're our friends as advisors. Some some advisors are never going to think outside the box. And sometimes they just need a little reality check. And Right now, if you're an advisor, your clients are getting information from the Options Industry Council. They're going to free seminars and they're learning for themselves. If you're an advisor, and this isn't Swan. Swan is an advisor that's done this for 15 years. I'm saying if you're the advisor out there that hasn't taken the time to learn, your clients are. Your clients are going to find guys like Randy because they understand how to use options to hedge risk and give portfolios potential income. So advisors thinking out of the box is one thing, but give them a little shot to the nose. Maybe that's my job on this show as an advocate for the right way to use options. Your your clients are going to get the education if you don't. And number two, um, all the accountants I'm talking to, uh, they're seeing an uptick 
in the reporting that they have to do on their tax returns for their clients that are not working with advisors, their clients are using options. So if the outside the box listeners aren't out there uh, getting in touch with guys like Randy in the industry, maybe maybe they need a little shot in the nose from from the mountain man here, Uncle Mike, <laughs> to say, look, your, your clients are out there and they're going to learn this stuff because we there actually, are vehicles. We actually have gotten advisors from that exact same reason. A client will find hear about us and, and go to their client, go to their advisor and say, hey, what about this? Have you considered this? So that that definitely has happened. Uh, you know, the industry is going to, it's always going to move slow. People do not like change. People have felt comfortable in what they've done. But uh, yes, individual clients that are hungry for knowledge and, and, and really, quite frankly, helped me search for the, I think, the holy grail in our investment strategy is to find something that's better. And, you, you know, I spent the first probably 15 or 20 years of my investment experience in my life to get to the point where I said there's got to be something better out there. And options, I think, obviously are it. And you have to wonder, obviously, we do this show to to bring in new recruits from the advisor fold and to maybe beat the drum a little bit for some of the faithful out there. But you have to wonder if you are that proverbial advisor out there who is thinking about getting into options. And you weathered the storm of 08 and 09, and most advisors probably had their worst years on record during those two periods. If that wasn't enough, if that wasn't sufficient to make you perhaps lift your head out of the long only equity sandbox and say, maybe there's some other toys I want to play with here. <laughs> if that wasn't enough to get you over that tipping point, I kind of wonder what it will take at this point to really get them to really, like I said, lift their heads up and look around a bit and see what's out there. And maybe it is also something that we see just in the media as well, that negative perception of options that is still percolating out there in many, many scenarios. I'm sure you see it, Randy, when you're talking to new potential clients and potential funds. That I'm sure there's initial recoil when you mention options. God forbid you bring up the D word. That's pretty much verboten in most conversations, I would think. But just you, the mention of the fact that, hey, I'm going to incorporate options into your portfolio to someone who is, let's say, less sophisticated, that's probably a terrifying moment to them the first time you bring that up with them. And so I'm sure maybe a lot of advisors are feeling that client pushback and they might be scared to bring their clients to that next level. So there's kind of a probably a, uh, a impasse that they're at at that point where they can't really get to that next level, which is to start implementing things like insurance, protective puts, covered calls, and things like that. Would you agree there, Randy? I definitely would agree there. Uh, the last couple of years, we've seen a huge increase in demand. Uh, we spoke at a couple of conferences, uh, I think a year or so ago, and one of the keynote speakers, I can't remember – who she represented, but she pretty much made the point, which is what we had been making for a while, is that you can't control risk adequately without the use of derivatives, even if it's a bad word. There's, I can hear the screams yes. from our listeners. The <laughs> D over. word. Randy said the D Pull word. Pull over to the side of the road, <laughs> listeners, please, for your own safety. And so I think that the, the, the next move is obviously I think the pensions, the big pension plans are going to start using this more. Um, I just think that you're going to – people just see the risk right now. People – People obviously do not want to lose the vast majority or a large percentage of their wealth. So I think they're motiva- highly motivated now to do this. And it just it's going to take a lot of education over time to say, hey, look at a firm like ours that, uh, you know, did by and large protect our clients in the 2008, 2009 down cycle. Um, and, and those if options are used properly, not necessarily a speculation or a, a massively leveraged position, but use them as they were intended. Then, then you can get the, redic- the risk reduction that you want. So we got increased education for advisors, obviously helping to bring them to the dark side, so to speak. We have helping them to get to think outside the box and perhaps overcome some of that initial client reluctance. But you've also mentioned a couple of times now that brokerage impasse, the hurdle of getting the brokerage firms on board with options. Why don't you Go into that in a little bit more detail of some of our listeners, why you think the brokerage firms are, are still such an obstacle for advisors who are looking to start adding options. Well, as we were talking about previously, the biggest problem in the industry is that most advisors have not had an appetite for options in their portfolios or their clients' portfolios. And when that is true, then the brokerage firms do not need to um, coddle to or, or help out those advisors like us that use options. So when we deal with various platforms over the years, I can't tell you the number of times that a, 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 a representative from a brokerage company would say, gosh, I've never seen that done before. Gosh, we don't have a need for that. We've never even co- 
had a concept of doing spread orders or um, having a limit on the size of orders to seven contracts. Seven contracts really uh, we're managing 150 million dollars. Um, that's not that's that's not realistic and and so it's just that's been, a whole lot of seven lots. <laughs> <laughs> that, so I think that that's over the years has happened. There's obviously a lot more scrutiny. The the brokerage firms are, are worried about getting sued about a, a fund blowing up one of the other big firms that allows individual investors to do spread orders in their IRA type accounts, but uh, they will not let an advisor do that. That's that's crazy. That's don't let the brain surgeon operate on your brain, but let you you can operate in your brain by yourself. That's that's the kind of logic they do. So it's just those kind of kinds of things have been slowly but surely. We definitely have found some brokerage firms that we like working with that accept that those type of that, that that embrace those types of advisors like ourselves others are, are will come around eventually it's just a matter of time when they see the business going to other firms um, you can either obviously lead on this thing or you can you can follow at some point it's almost the same uh, predicament of the advisor looking for the client you know if you're not educating yourself on the options your clients will find the advisors that are so you know as a an advocate once again, I will give the the brokerage firms the same fair warnings as the advisors then aren't option friendly. Firms like Randy, firms like mine, will find the option friendly uh, custodians that are that are able to facilitate our business. And we we see the market going in a place where people, the client, the end user, the demand is going to come into the into the market and say, "I want options." And they're going to go to the advisors that have been doing the options, understand the options, and they're going to need those advisors to have the custodians that are options-friendly, option-centric, that understand uh, seven contracts on $150 million in assets. That's a lot of seven lots, like I said before. Absolutely. I would say that the, the brokerage, the custodians and the broker firms would, should want the business because they don't want the business to go out the back door. But one of the things that we talk to our advisors about is, our program of, of hedging catast- against catastrophic losses in the portfolio really, quite frankly, protects their business because, as every advisor knows, if your asset base gets cut down by a third because of a sell-off or a bear market, you're going to lose some naturally some clients anyway. This is this is a great way for advisors to protect their own book of business as well as, quite frankly, um, you know, custodians and brokerage firms. The more money they have under 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 their umbrella, the more money that they're likely to make. So they've got every incentive in the world um, to to want to embrace things like this. Yeah, you know, it is interesting to see that so many brokerage firms are still so reticent to dive into this fray, and it, because exactly like you said, this advisor who's using a lot of options, has a lot of assets under management, it's a very desirable client. They're trading more actively. They're hedged, so their exposure in the 0809 scenario is much less than the typical naked, long-only equity guy. And yet, for a number of reasons, they're not pursuing them. And I, I tend to wonder if maybe part of that reason is because of the dichotomy that's sprung up in the brokerage world, where a lot of the focus on options has come from the smaller niche targeted players who are going after the very active high-end retail clients with advanced tools and advanced strategies. And yet a lot of the advisors are still housed in what you might call more of the traditional equity type large houses who haven't been as quick, let's say, to embrace some of the options, technology, and and fundamentals. And we have seen some acquisitions and some a lot of different developments in that space over the past few years that large firms have been acquiring some of these smaller, more niche players, and hopefully that expertise and that desire to trade and, and interact with options will spill over into that larger those larger firms. But I wonder if how much of that is still the reluctance on the part of these traditionally large, primarily equity only houses that say, hey, you know, this has not been a core part of our business in the past. There's no reason why it should be in the future. Let's leave this to this small niche area of the business where is not our strength and perhaps a lot of them also conflate them as still being risk additive products as opposed to risk mitigating or risk neutral type products, which when they're implemented correctly, of course, they can be. So I wonder how much of that you think is just that dichotomy in the brokerage space playing out in the advisor world as well. Yes, I agree. I would agree with that. I would also point out a couple of things. One, um, we basically are in the process of negotiating, and we think a large deal right now. And, and the the platform that they're using does not even allow options, and so they're, they're, that firm is going to lose probably hundreds of millions of dollars just from that alone. 
The other point I wanted to make was it's it's interesting that when you look at the each individual platform or custodian's trading platform on the retail side, they're always almost more robust than the actual institutional side for options. And that just that blows my mind that that is still that way. But I think it goes back to there isn't there hasn't been the demand in the past. It's it's got to change. You need you need people that are going to force that and push that down to make that happen quicker. Yeah, it's ironic that your average high end retail guy is far more savvy and more demanding from a tools perspective than your average advisor who has a couple hundred million dollars under management yet isn't as he's not out there writing multi leg iron condor swaps on a regular basis. I could go on for years about that 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 dynamic. The uh the thing that what you're ta- – and I'm not going to because I, it just frustrates me and I want to keep my hair. The dynamic that, that I see it as, you know, to dovetail on what Randy said and the, the questions that you brought up, the, the same thing broker terms are looking at that don't get into options custody seriously. There's a company called Kodak that could still be making cameras if they put the necessary money into the R&D. I think there's a lot of brokerage firms out there that are waiting for what they consider normal to come back. And I really don't think what they assume is normal is coming back. And they really need to put some money and some foresight into research and development into what the new normal is becoming, and that is how to hedge risk, how to manage risk. And like Randy said earlier, um, you want to hedge apples with apples, not apples with oranges. The best way to hedge equity portfolios is with equity derivatives, equity options, not um, made up whatever they're called, derivative stuff. The real stuff, the listed, exchange-listed uh, equity options on those stocks. So Now, that, we've, uh, we've hit on, I think, education or lack thereof on the advisors, kind of keeping them from the fray. We've hit on perhaps some client reluctance, some of the, the brokerage, brokerage impediments. Uh, maybe let, let's dovetail into some of the maybe the, the demand side of the equation where we have the large funds – and the the consultants who are the intermediaries to those large funds and what their viewpoint and their traditional reluctance has been to just not want to touch with touch derivatives with any sort of 10 foot pole a lot of large pension funds out there have had restrictive covenants for a number of years saying they cannot do anything even as simple as buy a protective put as mind numbingly insane as it might seem to those of us here on the show that's been the the just the way business has been done there for a long time Randy, you're interacting with these funds and also these consultants on a regular basis. Are you starting to see them become more interested, more willing to supply that demand to say, hey, we're going to allocate 2% of our portfolio to someone who can manage options? Because without that demand, without that influx of funds coming in, how much incentive is there for advisors to turn around and say, I'm going to become specialized in this area? So are you starting to see those floodgates open up more? I think they're beginning to open up. I think it's a slow process. Uh, it's probably going to take a while longer to, for that to really um, come to fruition. But I, th- I think that we're in the right direction. We're moving in the right direction. One of the things that we're doing to maybe not facilitate the process of allowing other advisors to, to kind of overcome some of the problems with, with platforms and brokerage issues and, and convincing clients is our firm's actually launching a mutual fund in July that's going to offer our basic uh, strategy to – this is obviously going to open up for a lot smaller individuals to get in as well as just for people to – some advisors love the concept of, of separately managed accounts and other advisors would not – do not ever want to go down that path and come up with the same issues that you had mentioned earlier. But I just – I can't go back to every one of my clients and get them to sign an options agreement or, or a margin agreement or writing options and and all that kind of stuff. So we think this will be an avenue for people that, that it's just they cannot ever get over that hurdle to, to participate in this kind of situation and the kind of uh, risk reward that we try to design. You know, and not to jump back to the brokerage thing, but as we were just talking, I was thinking as well, one of the other most common complaints or criticisms we hear from advisors who are reticent to dive into options is the still to this day, which is an amazing thing, the, the lack of scalability of a lot of the tools that they have at their disposal. I mean, a lot of these guys, if you're managing dozens or hundreds of client accounts and they want to roll a call on XYZ stock in one account and then replicate that across dozens or hundreds of accounts, 
there still are not very many good tools out there for doing that and scaling that strategy up short of them having to go into every account and executing that call and then going into the next account. And while these guys are still out there tracking these positions and good old Excel spreadsheets, and it is amazing in this day and age with so many assets on the line here that there aren't more in the way of tools structured and designed specifically to solve problems like that, like how to advisors can help scale and implement these tools on a much larger scale. Is that a problem you've had to encounter, Randy? Have you had to design your own proprietary stuff to execute these things? Are you still running Excel spreadsheets like so many others out there? No, there is, as, as far as we know, there's nothing out there that um, would, would do the things that we need to do to be able to allocate uh, across hundreds or thousands of accounts. We've had to internally develop our own software to be able to do these issues. I always tell people what we do is not rocket science, but we do have a rocket scientist on staff that does the programming for us. So we, we have our own proprietary programs that, quite frankly, we would not be able to do what we do uh, without these types of programs. In fact, when we enter into larger agreements with other, other advisors or other firms, th- we pretty much have to license our software because we don't think what we ha- is, exists out there at this level. It is amazing that in this day and age, that is still such a, an obvious and clear stumbling block that people, if they want to get into it, they have to essentially build it themselves. And that's a huge hurdle for a lot of people to have to get over. And it seems so rudimentary in this day and age. But you're right. The retail tools are still, in many senses of the word, far superior than what we have available for the institutional and for the, the options set. Well, Randy, I think that's about all we have here for our interview segment. But I think now we're going to dive into our industry buzz segment. Busy financial advisors don't have time to follow the latest developments from the options market. So we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. And welcome to the Industry Buzz segment. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we dive into some of the latest happenings and going on in the world of both advisors and options. And as luck would have it, we happen to be down here in New Orleans at the Nexus, the crossroads of both worlds right now, where the options world and the advisor world are meeting for the first time. And there's been all sorts of chaos and fistfights ensuing in the hallways. Now, but actually, we are here at the site of the 2012 Wealth Advisor Summit as well as the 2012 Options Industry Conference. And the hope therein is to bring some of those two audiences together to start discussing these products in some interesting and intelligent ways. And Randy, I've been stuck in this room for the past few days, so I haven't really had a chance to go out and and speak to the attendees of the different shows or listen to some of the panels. What has been some of your takeaways from talking to the people and listening to some of the panels? What are you kind of hearing? Is the buzz coming out of this conference? What are some of the hot topics and some of the hot discussion points? I think the overall theme that I uh, that I've heard over the last couple of days is is the concern of of what to do in today's environment with the risk that's out there as well as the low rate, the low interest rate environment. I'm actually on a panel in about an hour. We're supposed to talk about cash alternatives. And of course, to make 0.1% per year, I'm like, really, what's the panel really going to be about? <laughs> I think that's one of the jokes. That's, I, uh, that's scintillating <laughs> stuff. Yeah. I, I told, I actually told the guy, the moderator of the panel, I said, well, you know, as a, as an options guy, I, I, we don't even do cash alternatives, but I said, I could, I could go through some examples of some uh, overlay strategies and, and some uh, income generating strategies to add to cash. But uh, I think that's just it. I think that people, there aren't really the great solutions out there that everyone wants to hear. I think people are kind of throwing up their hands and they're going to do the best thing they can do, which is probably continue the course. Of course, we think that the course should be shifted in the direction of options and and, uh, to generate income as well as protection. But uh, I think that's why these people are here. You should blow that panel's mind and tell them how to construct a synthetic T-bill using options. And that would would immediately clear the room in terror. But it would be an interesting conversation starter for that panel. And Mike, I know you've been floating around the options industry conference a little bit here as well. What are some of the the interesting takeaways and developments and and the buzz you're hearing from from down there. Yeah, it's interesting because there's a collaboration of events here. So yes. there's, there are two events. So you've got the Wealth Advisors Summit, which by far, hands away, what Randy just said is number one. The advisors are here on behalf of their clients trying to figure out whether it's cash-based management solutions or equity. They're here looking for investment 
ideas in this environment, whether it's yield, whether it's equity, protection, whatever it is. That's definitely number one. Now, on the other side of the conference, you've got more of the industry people um, at the options industry conference. So it's not the wealth advisors as much as it's the options industry, call them thought leaders, call them whatever they are in the industry. The buzz on that side of the, of the conference is more in tune with why are volumes going down? Why are options still perceived as risky? And I think the two main points coming out from over there have to do with um, regulation, overregulation, whatever it is, in, in the dropping volume. And the Dodd-Frank bill keeps coming out, mm -hmm. the Volcker rule. Basically, you, you see a whole industry here that uh, you call it the horse in the barn scenario. Uh, there are some very sharp people here that are good to the core people that want to do well for their clients, for their constituents, uh, and feel like they're locked in a barn right now because they don't understand what the industry is going to look like in six months. So a lot of buzz about the political makeup as well. Um, so the two people that really hit it off at the conference that we're talking about the, the two issues, so the, the one primary being uh, regulation, where's the clarity in the landscape six months from now, whatever it is, Dodd-Frank, Volcker Rule. Uh, John Haig from McGladry is the managing director, gave a one-hour-long presentation on what rules are coming out. Uh, just did an excellent job on a topic that would put most people to sleep. You know, it could be mm. the cure for insomnia. Yes. But he really did a great job highlighting, hey, here's a 42-page rule that changes SEC Rule 17A-5B and, you know, was helping the BDs in the room and the RIAs in the room that have those kind of reporting issues, g giving them clarity and understanding that, hey, this is, you know, this is why we're treading water right now. So I thought that was good. And then the last point I'll make is on the other side of the room, not the wealth advisor side, but the uh, the options industry conference, political climate right now. So it's an election year. Uh, they brought in Charlie Cook. He was the keynote speaker of the Cook Report. And uh, he talked for about two hours. I mean, he was really into it. His arms were flailing. He was up on the soapbox, would make uh, Federal <laughs> Holiday Mike very proud for how passionate he was about his beliefs on, on the political climate and being an election year and uh, what kind of impact that has on the stock market and what the industry can do from a broker-dealer, RIA, uh, and the companies that serve those people in the industry. So that's the buzz. I don't know if you can really say that's buzzworthy. Um, they're very, what you would say, very esoteric and very kind of monotonous to the normal advisor out there listening. But it is fascinating to say, hey, advisors, if you're out there and, you're, and you plan on doing things the right way, hang in there. I really believe that there's a lot of talent. There's a lot, a lot of thought leadership. Everybody right now is experiencing the same almost chokehold feeling. And I think it has a lot to do with the election, the uncertainty that's pooled around the election, and then the uncertainty of the you know the outcoming rules. So hang in there, keep swimming, little fishes. Um, I think you know I've never been more optimistic about being in a, in a good spot for uh, the investment world. I've always told people that the supply side right now is diminishing. You know, firms like MF Global collapsing. It, it gives people a bad mark in the industry, but bad people do bad things sometimes, whatever. I'm not going to get uh, in a political fight. These opinions are my own, whatever, disclosure, disclaimer. But I'm just saying on the supply side, if you're an advisor, hang in there. Um, the uncertainty and the landscape, all that stuff, if you're around in six years, you're going to laugh about this. Uh, but just you know, keep doing the right thing. Um, the other thing I will say is on the demand side, there might be a little bit more a, a little bit less money supply. You know, people might have had more wealth five years ago than they do now, but they're still demanding uh, good advisors. So if you're in the industry side of the business, hang in there. If you're a client, talk to advisors that have your best interest in mind and are willing to, like Randy said earlier, think outside the box and use options. So that is all the industry buzz in 4,000 words or less. Well said, Uncle Mike, or should I say Federal Holiday Mike. I couldn't have, couldn't have said it better myself. I suppose it is a little sad on a side note then that compliance and regulatory minutiae are such growth industries at this conference. That just, that just goes to show the state that the industry is in post-MF Global and everything else, that that is where the action is. If you're a regulatory compliance consultant, you, have, uh, you are a busy fellow in this they day win. and age. Hey, you know, it's all cyclical right now. The pendulum's being pushed that way, so... Right now, the compliance consulting firms are 
you know, they're doing great. So if you're an advisor, talk to them because, um, you know, they, they're going to need help managing all the money they're making in five years when the pendulum swings back the other way. So it's just good to know what the industry's doing. Well, I agree. I think with that, we're going to close out this industry buzz segment as well as this episode of the Advisors Option. We, of course, want to thank our guest, Randy Swan from Swan Wealth Advisors, for joining us on the program today. And, Randy, before we go, anything else you'd like to leave our listeners with today? Nope. I've enjoyed being on this program. It was a lot of fun, and I appreciate the opportunity. Well, we're glad to have you on. We'll have to bring you on again down the road to just dissect some more of the options business and how it's impacting the advisor world. And we, of course, also want to thank all of you out there for downloading and streaming and subscribing to this program and making it such a success. And we'll see you next time right here on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit advisor.optionseducation.org. presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com/radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.